Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on what I think will be another great episode of All Things Aviation and Aerospace. You know, each week I try to accomplish three things on this show. One is to provide engaging an engaging environment for participate, uh, for the participants and the viewers. Say that three times real fast. The second is to narrow the generation gap, or what I feel is a generation gap, between seasoned aviation and aerospace professionals and aspiring young aviation professionals. And third, uh, inspire many of you out there who are interested in aviation and aerospace but are not sure where to start, and also let you know the wide variety of opportunities that are available. That, that's really you know, the gist of what is trying to be accomplished by doing this show every week and having so many different types of guests on. And, and I really, and the part I enjoy the most is, is actually having the young people on who can ask questions and give perspectives uh, from, you know, their being in high school, middle school, college, uh, and that type of thing. So it's, it's pretty cool to do that. We have a very special guest today, and he is a seasoned aerospace professional. He's currently the Vice President of Operations at Flight Research at the Mojave Air and Spaceport out there in the Mojave Desert. We just had a really funny conversation because he's like, oh, it's pretty mild out here, actually. We're, we're enjoying the weather. And I said, well, let's put that in perspective. What do you call mild? He said, oh, we're in the 90s. I said, yeah, okay, um, sure. <laughs> if, 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 if being in the 90s is mild, then yeah, um, gotcha. So anyhow, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Mojave Air and Space Port out there in the Mojave Desert, uh, it is a public use airport, but it's also known for flight testing and for space industry development. Uh, and it, it takes place, um, at, you know, it's, it's being in a wide open, relatively unpopulated area that makes it uh, doable for that. Uh, but it is also in close proximity to uh, the infamous uh, Edwards Air Force Base, who also does a lot of flight testing, et cetera, and, and, uh, and different types of, of space development. So it's, it's a perfect location, whether you like the heat or not, they, they absolutely don't get rain, uh, but it's perfect location for that kind of uh, aviation and aerospace activity. Anyhow, as I was saying, Scott Glaser is a Senior Vice President of Operations at Flight Research. And we're gonna learn a lot about flight research during the show. We will also learn a lot about Scott's background, but to give you just a little, little taste of it, Scott has a bachelor of science and a master's degree in aerospace engineering from Penn State. I won't hold that against you about Penn State. Um, and he is, has an MBA from the Quantic School of Business and Technology, as well as his doctorate in biomedical engineering from Drexel University. And, and that's just his education credentials. Scott's experience credentials include aerodynamic decelerator design and manufacturing engineering. He has tons of experience as a flight test engineer. He's been a flight controls engineer uh, and, and a few other things I'm probably sure he'll be sharing with us. Bottom line, if you want to learn how to safely get out of trouble using proven recovery techniques during a problematic in-flight situation, you definitely want to have Scott in the cockpit next to you. Scott Glacier, welcome to All Things Aviation and Aerospace. Thank you, Vince. Thank you for the kind words. It's nice to be here. It's great to have you here. I know you've been really, really busy, so appreciate you taking the time to hang out uh, with us and, and tell us a little bit more about what you do and about flight research. Now, I'm going to take an extra couple of minutes because I got to tell you about this first young guest. We have three young guests on the show with us, and as you guys know that watch the show, I always try to do that. Uh, and I like the cross-section I have this time starting with a middle schooler. So I have uh, Joshua Gibson. He is now in eighth grade. Uh, he's an eighth grade honor student uh, at Julius West Middle School in Rockville, Maryland. Now, here's a story about Josh that's, that's kind of fun to tell. So uh, my kids went to the same school that Josh currently goes to, the same middle school. And back in the day, I was you know uh, on the board of the PTSA, Parent Teacher Student Association, which we used to just call PTA. And his mom was also on that. So I got to know his mom a bit, um, but it wasn't until years later that I ran into her in a grocery store and she casually mentions to me when I asked how the kids are doing, she says, oh, you know, um, 
Josh was fine. He's, he's uh, actually interested in aerospace engineering. And I kind of just gave her a dirty look because I was like, wait, you know that I live and breathe everything aviation. And you're just now telling me that your son is interested in aerospace. But I forgave her and I said, okay, cool. I'll keep in touch. And by the way, consider me now a mentor for Joshua about this industry. Uh, so a little time goes by and it's, we're coming up on the 100th birthday of Brigadier General Charles McGee, the Tuskegee, the infamous Tuskegee Airmen, the iconic Tuskegee Airmen. And we're coming up on his birthday and having an event for it. He's going to do some flying, et cetera. And we're having a luncheon. And I thought, you know, this is a good way to introduce Joshua uh, even further into the aviation realm. So I contacted his mom and I said, hey, uh, do you think Joshua could go to this event? And, you know, her first response was, well, it's on a school day. Uh, and, you know, instinctively, it was like, well, you know, I guess I could take him out of school for a day, especially for something that's important. But then being the mom she is, she said, well, no, he's going to have to ask permission because I'd like him to be able to do it. And get, because of the significance of it, that he doesn't get docked a day of school. So she had him write an essay. Actually, it was just going to be a note. <laughs> it turned into an essay. And, uh, and turned that into his sixth grade administrator because he was 11 at the time in sixth grade, his um, counselor and his principal. Well, he did that. Um, and needless to say, he got the day off uh, for this significant event. But what was cool is when she sent a copy of it to me and I read it, I said, oh, wow, this is really impressive. He did a really nice essay about Tuskegee Airmen and about the general and everything. So I asked, I called her and I said, hey, do you think he'd be okay with, you know, presenting this and reading it in front of the general and, and the, the people attending the lunch? And she just right there said, hold on a second, let me ask him. And she, she says, Joshua, will you do this? And initially he said no, and, but he thought pretty quickly because like five seconds later he goes, he thought about it. And he thought, well, wait a minute, this is for a hundred year old Tuskegee Airman iconic. Yeah. I'll do it. And then he tells his mom, yeah, I'll do it, but I got to work on it. I want to tweak it a bit. You know? So, and fast forward, he uh, attended the luncheon with his mom and he was there in his suit and everything and stood up on stage and he made the presentation. He, he, he knocked him out of the park, blew the general away along with everybody else in the audience. Uh, and that was the beginning of something that started to propel his um career interest further in terms of aviation and aerospace because he was inspired by the whole thing and it went with Brigadier General McGee's uh, mantra of wanting to uh, it's something he talks about all the time wanting to inspire the next generation wanting to encourage the next generation to uh, to get into this industry and take it to the next level uh, which most of that uh, has to do with space uh, and that type of thing so it, it really kind of kicked things off and, and Joshua made a name for himself so much so that the, he got attention of a number of people. And then as he, uh, we were just talking about earlier, he, he went to uh, the largest air show on earth or, or air event. Uh, and that's at Oshkosh, air, EAA Air Venture at Oshkosh, the Experimental Aircraft Association, for those who are not familiar. Uh, really big event, uh, spent a week there and had a really good time, learned a lot. And now here he is uh, sitting on all things aviation and aerospace, hanging out with us in flight research. Joshua Gibson, welcome to the show. Thank you, Vince. Glad to have you here. Um, and I also, I should mention that that, that event was uh, hosted by, the, by AOPA's National Aviation Community Center. And uh, they, they did an amazing job putting that together uh, for the general and, and all the things that went with it. So pretty cool. Plus it was neat to see the general fly uh, a couple of jets uh, that, that day. So the next young man, which continues this whole thing of the, the excitement I have of having these, these uh, young folks on the show, Isai Villanueva um, is a high school senior at Rex and Margaret Fortune Early College High School in Elk Grove, California. Now, Isai, I met at Oshkosh also, and the, and the reason I met him is because I, I was spending a lot of time with Brigadier General McGee, who was, who was attending uh, the event, and he 
there was an event in reference to uh, a training aircraft of Piper uh, with a red tail on it, uh, obviously significant to the, the Tuskegee red tail factor. And, and uh, so I had, a, I, I saw him being, you know, having a chance to meet the general and being acknowledged with his accomplishment and, a, and I believe a scholarship. Tell us a little bit about that, et cetera. And so I, I saw his mom and I said, uh, hey, can I, can you give me a way to, to be, stay in touch with you guys? I'd probably like to, to talk with him later about being on, on the, the webcast. And she popped out a resume, <laughs> like any good mom would. And, but after learning more about him and contacting him for this show, I find out that Isai is actually a, um, he's got his uh, glider pilot's license. And then two days ago, he passed his private pilot check ride. So he is now a glider pilot and a um, private pilot for, as he would say, six single engine land, or as I would just say, he flies, you know, single engine aircraft. And he um, is, so he's got two of his licenses already at the age of 17. Uh, and in addition to getting ready to graduate next year, he's a senior uh, at the high school. He is. He will also have two associate degrees. Um, already getting his college stuff underway. So he has lots to tell us about that and and a little bit more about his background and everything. But Isai, we're really glad to have you and and welcome to all things aviation and aerospace. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. It's great to have you here and and congratulations again on your achievement just the other day of getting your private. We all remember those first days when we. You know, when we solo, when we get our first ticket and things like that. So pretty awesome. And our third guest, uh, I also met at Oshkosh and, and uh, was actually uh, at the uh, doing my thing at the Airbus uh, Pavilion. And a young man came in who wanted to talk to their vice president, Airbus's vice president of research and technology. And dad was kind of elbowing him on to like just go up to her and start talking and which he did. But while he was doing that, that popped a resume on me. And, and so I said, good, I'll, I'll touch base with Cody and, and also invite him as an opportunity to be on the show. Cody is a computer science major with an emphasis in AI, artificial intelligence and data science. He's a senior at the Milwaukee Institute of Engineering in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He has a strong interest in aviation and aerospace and comes from a, a strong background with it, with the experience of, of uh, his dad, who's, who's worked uh, for years in the industry uh, on the maintenance side, et cetera. So, um, Cody, welcome to the show. Having me, Vince. Yeah. So, as I said, I took a little long because I really wanted to tell you guys about, about these guys because it's pretty impressive in terms of, of what they're doing and and um, uh, really excited to have him on board. Scott, you, sure. you have a really unique background and a very specialized background and Flight Research is somewhat of a unique company as I mentioned earlier. Can, can you just start out by telling us a little bit about who, who and what Flight Research is, what kind of things you do, you guys do, tell us about the cool stuff. <laughs> um, well, that would be a long conversation, we only have an hour. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be a part of the team at Flight Research. Um, it's, a, it's a unique place in the world, uh, both physically being at Mojave Air and Spaceport, with, which is a mecca of, uh, of aerospace history and achievement. Flight Research has been around since 1982. And in general, we do uh, three things. We do uh, flight testing. We do advanced pilot training. And we do uh, aircraft uh, maintenance and leasing support. So flight testing is some of the, the cool stuff we do. So uh, we, we service customers across the board. Somebody brings us a widget, a box, a pod, something like that. They need it flight tested either for civil certification or military applications, whatever. And uh, we can either put it on our aircraft, we can fly their aircraft, how, whatever's, whatever's necessary. And we execute that flight testing, excuse me, uh, to whatever the, the mission requirements are. Um, we also provide support for those organizations. 
They, a lot of our customers maybe are smaller companies. They don't have their own flight test departments. They don't have their own flight test facilities. So they'll come to our facility and they'll use uh, several of the areas that we have, whether it's hangar space or office space, airspace, whatever, uh, to set up their flight test ops. And in those case, some of those cases, we just give them a home. We say, welcome, and we stand back and let them do their thing. In other cases, they don't have any flight testing capability or their, their flight testing capability is maxed out. So they hand it to us and say, please test this component or this aircraft or whatever. Uh, so that's, that's really a lot of fun. The other thing that we do is uh, advanced pilot training. Uh, so that's everything from flight test training to uh, upset recognition and recovery training. Vince, you, you referenced some of that in the discussion. And that's largely the public face of our company. That's something that uh, our sales and marketing people go out and, and share with the world. And um, we are the, the world's leading provider of URRT. Uh, we recently signed a contract with Flight Safety International, if you're familiar with that organization, the largest uh, civilian provider of aer aerospace training in the world, and we are their official upset uh, training provider. We've partnered with them on that. Uh, really rewarding what, what work. What's URRT you just mentioned? Just upset our... recognition and recovery training. Thank you. Yeah, so that's uh, airplane finds itself in a bad way and pilots, uh, training pilots how to deal with that. And we can go into that in a little more detail uh, later if you want as to why that's important. Um, but that's a, that's a, a large part of, of what we do. Sure. Uh, we also, in the training side, uh, uh, do spaceflight training. So both for spaceflight participants, the folks that are uh, buying rides from uh, Mr. Branson and Mr. Bezos, uh, as well as for professionals, astronauts, uh, engineers, um, um, uh, program managers, all that kind of stuff. We do that sort of training. And then lastly, we have, uh, we have our own maintenance department. Uh, and we, we lease uh, a lot of the aircraft that, uh, that we have. Our, our maintenance department is second to none. They, we have a fleet of uh, 44 aircraft of 22 different types that they manage. Um, and a lot of those airplanes, while some of them are, are standard category airplanes, a lot of them are experimentals uh, that these folks have to know like the back of their hand and, uh, and, and do, some really, do some really amazing work. I'm, I'm amazed every day at the work that our, uh, our, our uh, uh, maintenance department does. So that's kind of uh, flight research uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Yeah, I, you know, it, it goes well with your background um, when you when I hear you describe it. So why don't you tell us a little bit, how did you even get into aviation? Uh, you know, you, it, you have a kind of a cool story about that. Yeah, it's certainly uh, unique. I'll give you that. Um, so I got my first airplane ride from from my dad when I was uh, six weeks old as he tells the story. And from then six it was weeks. Kind of six weeks. Yeah. Okay. He had a, he had a, he had a, a Ryan Navy on at the time. Actually it was North American Navy on to be, be precise. And, um, and uh, yeah, so he came my first ride from, it was pretty much over from there. Um, and my interest from the start has always been the whole, the, the whole idea of, of humans traveling through the air and space. So when we're in these vehicles, how those vehicles work, but how we interact with them. And, and everyone who flies knows that once you, once you strap this vehicle on, because that's really what you're doing, you know, it's not quite like putting on a seatbelt in a car. You're, you are part of this vehicle and how that, that whole system works. Uh, so I, I didn't just want to be a pilot or want to be an engineer. I wanted the whole thing. Um, so, so I got a couple of degrees in aerospace engineering from Penn State. Uh, I got a, uh, a, a PhD in biomedical engineering from Drexel. It's really an aerospace physiology. They just didn't know what department to stick me in. So they put me in the biomed department. It seemed to work. After all of your engineering experience, why did you want to uh, add biomedical? You know, why did you want to add the physiology element to your? your well, that's education? us. That's, that's the human part of it. What I found um, whenever we were doing engineering, uh, there are folks that understand the the vehicles, the spacecraft, the aircraft really well. And there are folks that understand humans as well as we can understand humans. It's actually, uh, it's a difficult problem, obviously, because uh, we're all very different. Um, but, and there are some people that, that, that work very diligently to bridge that gap, but it's all kind of compartmentalized. And again, that's, that's my perspective. And what really excites me is, is how, they're really not separate. Whenever the vehicle is operating, um, they're, they're not separate things. It's all one. 
and, and all those things have to be reconciled. And, and that's really, I don't want to say it's not done well, because, because there's a lot of great work that's been done by a lot of really fantastic people, but it's not, not as well well understood uh, as, as I think it can be and as, it, as we need it to be moving into the future, particularly getting into where we're getting into with um, the, the air taxi services, the EV tall, the Joby kind of things, and the sorts of things that, uh, that Cody's going to be working on if he gets into aerospace with regard to computer science and AI, where these things are flying themselves and the human is now out of the loop. But there's some very human things that these vehicles do, even though they're just machines that we're going to have to compensate for decision making and things like that, um, that that are relevant that really aren't that well codified. Yeah, that's good that you brought that up, because that makes me want to ask you, Cody, how did aviation, besides the uh, familiarity through your dad, but how did aviation really come to the forefront of something you wanted to that you want to pursue and apply your computer science background to? Yeah, so, um, so I've, I've been, uh, I've participated in a lot of panels about AI and stuff. And I've noticed that most of the industries that are using AI is like in healthcare, uh, manufacturing and marketing and stuff, but I haven't really seen a lot of application or at least from what I've been exposed to from the panels at my school and whatnot, I haven't really seen a whole lot of applications of it in the aviation industry. And I was kind of, um, and that kind of intrigued me a little bit to kind of dig deeper and find out maybe why or what solutions haven't been found using AI quite yet um, in the aviation industry. AI is being actively pursued in, in aviation and aerospace. Uh, I'll let you speak to that, Scott. Yeah, um, it, it is, again, in a lot of these autonomous functions and in weapons and things like that, um, you don't see a lot of it yet because it's uh, not mature in, in the sense in the aviation uh, industry. One of the things that you're up against when you enter aviation with a new technology is there's a, a, a much higher um, level of analysis and demonstration when it comes to safety. And... And so you've got this, this technology now that can think for itself and the safety analysis folks and root cause analysis folks have no idea how to handle that. Um, and and I'm be, I, I shouldn't say no idea, I'm being a bit unfair. They're working very diligently in, into figuring out, but it's hard whenever you don't have just a line for line cause effect sort of, sort of error chain that you can go back to and say, here's how things Here's how things could fall apart. How do we mitigate that? And when you get to AI, that, that chain is, is a giant spider web that can do its own thing. And how do you ensure safety and something like that? Exactly. Maybe, oh, yeah. Go ahead. It's also very traditional. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yes. Scott. Or Cody. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So anyways, yeah, that's actually a really good point. And uh, we actually talked about this in my deep learning class where we learned about uh, neural networks and stuff, which basically is a way of simulating the human brain on a computer. And um, we talked about this idea that uh, one, like the bigger network you build, like the more complex it gets, um, you can't really trace it because there's just so many variables that are going on. Like there's, um, there's millions of different things going on and it's impossible to trace. And that's kind of the frightening part about it is that you can't, really tweak you can't really get down to a low level and tweak it to be absolutely uh be absolutely perfect um uh, you're only ever going to get to maybe a 99 percent accuracy when it comes to trying to predict some phenomenon or trying to um get it to accomplish some goal uh or at least that's how it is that's how it is currently with the technology that we have. Sure, but I'll tell you what, Cody, and I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here with this. There is an example of how it can be very effective and very positive, and Garmin has just shown that. Garmin has what's called an Autoland system. Autoland is not new. Um, it, it, it's, uh, there are a number of the larger aircraft made by Boeing and Airbus, et cetera, that have Autoland systems in them. Uh, as part of their uh, the autopilot technology. But 
the cool one about this that you guys can probably appreciate and relate to, this is in a small aircraft. This is in a Cessna 172 four-seat aircraft uh, that can land itself in if the pilot is, in, is incapacitated. And literally, uh, if the pilot has a heart attack or a stroke or something and, and can no longer function, whoever else is in the aircraft, whether they're sitting next to him or in the back, can push one button on the system and it will take over everything. It will start communicating with air traffic control. It will take control of the airplane and set it up properly to make sure it's flying properly. It will comfort the passengers. This is when you get into the AI stuff, right? You know, actually tell the passenger, this is what's going on. Just, you know, make sure your seat belt is fastened, relax. I got this, so to speak. I don't think it says I got this, but anyhow, <laughs> but it, and uh, I've, I've uh, there's a, a few people I know that have had the opportunity. Um, Joshua, you've met one, Pete Bunce, the, the president and CEO of the General Aviation uh, Manufacturers Association, Gamma. He's had the chance to, to be in an aircraft uh, and punch the auto land and watch it and have to sit on his hands to not want to fly the plane. Um, and, and then uh, Tom Haynes from AOPA has done the same, and I've known some others that have also had that privilege of literally pushing that button and watching the plane take over, find the airport, and land and stop and shut down the engine and everything on its own. Um, so so there's, we're heading in that direction of the technology, as both you and, and as Scott was saying, uh, but there's, um, you know, there's a long road ahead to, to that. And to Scott's point, it really is more than anything, it's about safety. And, and it's what, what are the safety protocols necessary to keep things safe, whether you're talking about one pilot or talking about a plane full of people. And I'll jump in with, with one other comment. Um, I've been fortunate in, in, work, in working with a lot of different teams and a lot of varied uh, industries. And what you find is that flight test in particular in, in the aerospace vehicle industry is very deterministic. You turn a switch, a light comes on. You have a certain aerodynamic profile and you expect a certain you know, lift drag, so on and so forth, and you can measure that directly. Conversely, on the human side of things, the physiology side of things, you know, when you talk about how the human brain works and cognitive, cognitive processes and stuff, you can't do that because you'd have to stick probes inside, inside somebody's head and that, that hurts and they particularly, you know, they, they don't appreciate that. And then it's hard to fly and all that kind of stuff. So, so it's largely statistics based. So particularly when you go to, when you go to aerospace professionals, flight testers in, to be very specific and you start talking about statistics, they check out. They're like, statistics are useless. You measure it directly. And if it's not direct measurement, it's no good. And a lot of them have that attitude, but when you don't have any other choice, statistics is the solution and it's, it's proven somewhat successful, but not perfect. And that's where, again, going back to what Cody was talking about, these things that we are designing that are machines are not going to be able to be measured deterministically like that. We're going to have to use statistics to do it. And you're going to have to convince an industry that doesn't like statistics to rely on it. And that's going to be a challenge in the future. There's all these, I guess that was the, the start of my earlier comment. Aviation has become very traditional. It used to be the leading edge, but now it's coming back to the point where it's, hey, it's always been done this way and that's what keeps us safe, which also hasn't always been true. So that's, that's some of the barriers that exist and in, in, in some of the challenges that the folks on this call are going to be facing in the, in the next few years. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point to bring up. And I, I want to move into another area, but I did want to mention one other thing. And that, that is where AI is going to play, is, is already playing and going to play a very important role in space exploration. Uh, because being able to send something to another, to the moon or to another planet uh, and have it have it function pretty much on its own uh, under, you know, autonomously um, and do that effectively. We've seen that in a couple of recent situations. So the Mars Perseverance rover um, went, it was launched and it had a long journey, almost six months or something like that to Mars. And then they just had to wait and hope that it did everything right and land on Mars and not crash on Mars. Well, we all know that it did do everything right. And then on top of that, they were able to, to launch the first helicopter 
uh, out there. And, and that by itself was a scientific achievement. But again, all of this, so it's kind of a mixture because it's like you send commands, a set of commands and tell it what to do. And then you sit back and have to wait and see if it did it right. And by the way, that's a 20 minute delay to get that information. So, um, uh, and there's- It sounds, like, it sounds like, sorry, that? that sounds like typical human interaction. <laughs> yeah, that, that's Ask it true. To do something, you give it about 20 minutes to see how it worked out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. So, but, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, I'm, I want to go to Isai. Isai, you have um, been very, very focused on aviation and aerospace um, in recent times. You, you I, actually, let me let you start out by telling us how aviation came into your world, uh, because now it is your world, it's very clear uh, with that. Uh, I saw your video of you uh, flying the, the glider, which was really cool. Uh, great video too, by the way, must have been a, a, a GoPro. And, uh, and then, you know, again, we, we talked earlier about the fact that you now have your private pilot's license for single engine land. So tell us how you how aviation came into your life, and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll take it a little further from there. Yeah. So uh, if I were to trace it back, it would have to be like a mix of influences. I just remember that uh, ever since I took my first like uh, ride in a, a airliner airplane to city some uh, some some city that I don't remember was such a long time ago. I just knew that um, this is what I wanted to do because it was just so much fun just looking down on the uh, and seeing like a bunch of city lights and buildings just grow smaller and smaller and shrink uh, further away. But um, fast forward to about uh, middle school, they had, um, there was like a high school fair to expose the middle school or students as to what high schools they could possibly choose as they were getting closer to graduation. And I remember uh, one of the high schoolers there had a, a ROTC program, which brought in a flight simulator that day. And they let me try it out. And then I had just had so much fun trying to figure out the controls, even though I wasn't very good at it at the time. And ever since then, I was like, mom, I, I really want to get into pilot training. And so we started looking for some scholarships. Um, at the time, I was around 13 or 14 years old. So I was looking to see what I could do at the time. And that's how I came across uh, glider pilots, because um, you can start your glider pilot training when you're 14 years old. And since I was almost of age, I knew that's how I wanted to begin with. And so I got my license between uh, 14 and 16. And then um, I passed my check ride for that on November 14th of 2020 when I was just a little bit over 16 years old. So as soon as that finished, I straight away moved on to uh, the single engine land airplanes and uh, God willing, I hope to just continue continue with that mindset of just uh, advancing my skills in aviation and my proficiency and just seeing how far I can go. Yeah, you were mentioning that you really want to um, look at the options that you would have in the industry. And, and so while you're on a pilot track, you're not narrowing it to that and saying that's the only thing. You're kind of looking at everything, even in terms of where you go to school and what you study, it's obviously going to most likely be uh, actually going to be because you said aviation related. But but you're you're still trying to um, um, figure that out. What questions do you have maybe for Scott and, and in reference to flight research and his background that might help you with uh, working through that? Um, I think the main question I would have for Mr. Scott would be. Um, like how would I, uh, what would be like the best route to get started as to work for like, um, for the flight research center? Like, um, and on top of that, like, are there any internships I can help like forward my progression towards a career that is potentially similar to yours? Um, yeah, so uh, there, there's not a, a, a clear path um, to what we do. What we do is very specialized. Other than to follow your aviation addiction, which you've already started to do quite well. Um, we have a, uh, you know, all of our pilots and engineers have a flight test background. Um, some have, some are, have been astronauts. Um, 
So we're very, very fortunate uh, again in, you know, I, I say flight research is uh, one of the greatest places in aviation. And, and I don't say that because I work there. I work there because that's the case. Um, so to get there, uh, again, uh, follow your passion, work your way up. We do have internships. So uh, you can get my information from Vince. So, so please feel free to, to forward, uh, forward your resume. We just uh, went through an internship cycle this summer. Um, and, and again, follow, follow what you're doing already. I, I will say your uh, glider license is a huge help to flying airplanes. Um, without understanding the challenges with pilot training already, it's already expensive and takes a long time. Um, without those, you know, notwithstanding those things, I think every pilot should get their glider license because one of the reasons that we're in business doing advanced pilot training is modern FAA-based standard civilian pilot training doesn't teach airmanship anymore. It does not. You are already worlds ahead of the folks that are going through and going straight to a Cessna 172 at a university or whatever and going straight up the airline path. You're already a better pilot than some of those folks. I can tell you that if you can fly a glider. So that's great. Um, keeping your, your um, perspective open, as Vince said, to other, other degrees, uh, not necessarily just the, pri the professional pilot degree, that's a great degree. Don't get me wrong. It's a good way to go. One of the things, you know, I went through the engineering track. I never really had, a, I, I never had a desire to only be an engineer, but one of the great things about engineering education is it teaches you problem solving, very, very critical problem solving. Sometimes it doesn't always teach you the best public speaking skills and interpersonal skills that's you learn on the business side, but the engineering route is, is something certainly to consider in just, just in the general case of um, uh, learning problem solving skills. My case, how I got here, um, I did a lot of things in parallel, right? I was an engineer, I was a professional engineer, but I was also working on my flying. Uh, I went the civilian track, I'm not military trained. Um, yet, you know, I, in, in my current job, I fly F5s and stuff like that. I am weird in that sense that, that I've been fortunate enough to be able to, to do that. And how I did it again was doing these things in parallel. I did engineering here. I worked on my flying, my flying ratings, but I did some, some odd things. Um, you know, I bought EAC 52. That's the short answer. Everybody asks how I got to, to fly these things. Like, well, it started when I bought EAC 52. I got this ru weird Russian airplane. And it really at the time, uh, I was just out of college and I knew I wanted to get, I needed to get a commercial rating and instrument rating. A, I wanted to work on aerobatics, complex, all that stuff. And the only airplane I could afford at the time was this weird Russian thing. So I found it, went out, bought one. And the really great thing about it and what you will all find is the most important thing in your professional success in life, whatever it is, is people. It's the people that you find and that you interact with. And in this particular case, the group of people around the Yak-52 is all these former military, current military, professional aviators, really some of the best in the world that just love to fly like we do. And they train anybody who's willing to learn in formation and, and tactical maneuvering and dogfighting and all these things that, that, you, that push a pilot's hand flying skills as hard as they can. And you just can't learn to fly an airplane better than that. And so I got involved with that group while I'm doing engineering, learning you know, how the F-22 flies and, and how 747 flies and how spaceships work and all that sort of thing, flying these airplanes, also doing physiology work and all that kind of thing, and, and just kept pressing forward. And anytime so, I mean, if somebody asked me, hey, do you want to go fly? Yeah. What time's a brief? When are we going? You know, and, and that's the answer. It's like, well, you got to fit. No, I, I, let's just let's go. And, and you, you got to be kind of relentless in that sense. And it all just kind of worked out. Uh, I had no idea that it would lead to, to where I'm at right now, which I'm very, again, I'm very thankful for. I love my job and the people I get to work with. Um, so I, I'm, I don't have a direct answer for you other than just be relentless in your, in your passion and your dreams and, and you'll find your way there. And it might be to flight research in Mojave and it might be to some other place. Uh, I would love to have it be flight research. That'd be a great story to tell. Um, but that's, uh, that's a long answer to a short question. Yeah, and you know what? You bring up something that that um, at the beginning and at the end of answering that question that is really important for you guys to all know, and that is every path is different, and and you don't know, you you, you can plan it out as best you can, but it will not 
quite end up the way you it, it'll end up what you want it to, but it, it won't be the go the way you want it to. It, there's going to be some, you know, some turns and curves and uh, a few roadblocks here and there that you'll you'll be challenged with. Uh, but if you stick with your goal, uh, as as you know, Isai from from your meeting the general, he has the four P's about one of them's perseverance. So you stick with your goal and keep going at it, then you'll accomplish what you want. Uh, as Scott said, flight research is very very unique, um, but all of these aviation companies have different unique aspects to them. You know, I mentioned before Garmin uh, and talking about that with, with artificial intelligence and, and uh, you know, you've got the, the SpaceX um, and uh, uh, some of the other companies I was gonna mention that. So we saw Blue Origin take some people up in orbit and back and no one was piloting the spaceship. Uh, on the other hand, we saw Virgin Galactic take some people up and they did have somebody pilot. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, there's just a lot of variations in there and that type of thing. I don't wanna lose uh, all my uh, time without uh, having an opportunity for Joshua to chime in with us. I, I gave him a, a bit of a long introduction at the beginning, so I stole some of his time. But Joshua, how about telling us a little bit about your interest from, in your words, uh, of, about how you became interested, uh, first in talking about aerospace engineering and getting into aviation, and, and how that's all transpired. Uh, I'm more so interested in the aerospace side of aviation. So I like rockets. Uh, I like seeing how everything works and comes together to go into space. Uh, can you say the question one more time? Well, this, this, I was just asking you to tell us a little bit how you became interested in it in the first place. We lost your audio there for a second. I really became interested at school since we were watching a lot of videos about aviation and aeros aerospace. And uh, it really just grew on me. And I got, uh, I wanted to learn more about it. So I read books and it really <laughs> affected me. Okay. So when I went to, I got invited to Mr. McGee's birthday party, and that's where I really got a taste of aviation. Sure. Listen, your audio went down really low. It was fine, and, and now we could hardly hear you. Uh, is there any adjustment you can do or just re, kind of reset your laptop there? Uh, I don't know. Okay. All right. That's okay. Um you, did you, uh, I wanted to give you a chance to see if you had any questions for Scott with regard to flight research. I know you did your own research on flight research, so I wanted to see uh, what questions you might have come up with. Uh, well, my biggest question was, what would aerospace training look like? <laughs> um, that, that, there's a, there's a, a lot of different aspects to aerospace training. Um, so it sounds like your interest is specifically in being an astronaut. Um, so to go from, from the eighth grade uh, to being an astronaut, um, it starts with uh, just your basic, uh, basic school classes and, and doing as best you can in those courses, uh, particularly math and science. You know, uh, obviously, those are, are very important to the engineering side of it. And then going on to, if you want to fly as an astronaut for, uh, for NASA, uh, then you go on from there and get a, a degree in, um, in uh, some STEM field, science, technology, math, something like that, so engineering. And they just, in the last round of applications, started requiring a master's degree. They didn't used to do that, uh, but they do now. So plan on that as well. And any kind of flying training you can get helps with space flight training. There are a lot of parallels between flying airplanes and flying spacecraft. And if, if nothing else, it's just the idea that you're in this vehicle that's off the ground. And now time and cognitive abilities and things like that become very, very important. So even though you're, the medium you're flying in, if you will, in an airplane is different than a spacecraft, 
still some of the timing and the criticality of things and the understanding is still very important. So, uh, so that's an important thing. Any, any sort of activity like that, that's, uh, that's intensive, uh, you know, safety intensive scuba diving, things like that is, uh, would, be, would be helpful to you to, to reach your goal of, of flying in space. Uh, aerospace training in general is very broad. That's everything from learning how, a glider, how, how Asai's glider flies, and there's still glider development out there, sailplanes for, for Vince. Um, <laughs> Or, you know, up to Elon Musk and SpaceX going to Mars or Virgin Galactic and uh, Spaceship Two taking passengers up. Uh, I spent about four years at uh, Virgin Galactic, so I can, uh, I can tell you about that. So that's, it's really what you want to make of it. Whatever you find interesting, uh, you, can, you can chase down that path and, uh, and, and still, still be a participant in this great, uh, great aerospace industry. Scott, can you tell us, break it down a little bit about uh, upset flight training? Uh, what, what, what's that like? Just to give us an idea of what somebody goes through. So, because you, you have experienced pilots that come through uh, mm -hmm. and and take that training. So, tell us a little bit about that and, and what what it actually is feels like. What's it like to to do that? Yeah. So, upset recognition recovery training, or the FAA calls it upset uh, prevention recovery training. Um, so loss of control in flight is the number one cause of fatalities in aviation around the world in every facet of aviation, commercial, business, private, whatever. And it comes from the fact that modern pilot training has, has gotten away from teaching basic airmanship skills. And we talked about this uh, a few minutes ago. We were talking about uh, Asai's um, glider training. And... The idea is in order to solve this loss of control problem, or at least get it under control, uh, pun intended, is, is to improve pilots' skills in hand flying airplanes, particularly when they find themselves in a bad way. So this is dynamic maneuvering of jet aircraft. So if you find the airplane upside down, what do you do about it? One of the things as, as humans, we tend, whenever we're in stressful situations, we tend to revert to our first learned skill. And as pilots, if we're doing particularly FAA training, we find ourselves a little bit nose down. What does the FAA teach you to do? Well, when we level, pull the nose up, particularly pull the nose up. Well, if you get rolled by a wake and your nose is down and you're here and you're stressed or panicked, then what do you do? First learn skill, you pull. So what is that? What happens there is the airplane ends up doing one of these numbers. And if the airplane's not certified to do it or you're too low to the ground or whatever, you end up either hurting yourself or killing yourself or, and everybody on board, which is, which is bad, obviously, right? That's what we're trying to avoid. So we're trying to instill these basic airmanship skills and how to maneuver an airplane in dynamic environments. Um, it's not the same as aerobatic training. That's a common misconception. Uh, aerobatic training is great training. I recommend everybody get it, but it's not the same thing. Aerobatic training is very, very scripted. So you're going to go out and you're going to do an aileron roll. So you go out and you hit a certain param set of parameters and you push stick over airplane rolls around. Same with loops and rolls and that kind of stuff. And if you take that to the next level in competition, now you're doing these very prescribed maneuvers and you got, you know, all the judges, the American judge, the Russian judge, all that kind of stuff, just like the Olympics. And, and you get judged and all that kind of stuff. Great training, great event, don't get me wrong, but it's different than upset training. So we get commercial pilots, military pilots, uh, you name it. We get the hurricane hunters, the folks from NOAA that go fly into hurricanes. They come out and train with us to learn what to do if they find themselves in a bad way in a hurricane. Um, so even they recognize that there's some very specific training value to, to, uh, to upset training. Yeah. I have time uh, for probably one or two more questions from each of you guys. So I'll, I'll go back to you, Joshua. Did you have any other questions or, or, or a follow-up question from uh, what you just asked, Scott? Uh, I have a question about AI and um, how it's affecting uh, flight research, if it's helping you guys or if it's hurting you guys. Oh, it's definitely helping um, because it is, it's a new, it's such a new technology um, that the larger companies don't know how to deal with it. And that's one of the things that we do. Uh, because we're a small agile company, we can, uh, we can look at different, um, you know, different technologies, new technologies, and implement them and test them more rapidly than some of the larger 
larger organizations. So uh, certain, certain customer uh, uh, technologies I can't talk about, but some of the things I can, uh, like for instance, um, the national campaign, which is NASA's, uh, NASA and the FAA's effort to figure out how all these air taxis, these EV tall, like Joby's and stuff like that, are going to work in the national airspace system. Uh, that test is going on at uh, Edwards Air Force Base as we speak, which is right next door to our facility. So we're providing helicopters that act as surrogates for these vehicles and pilots that, the test pilots that are helping set up these test programs. Uh, and, and they are literally helping NASA and the FAA write the book on how these things are going to be certified and flown. Excuse and me. that's so they, huge. Yeah, it is. It's, we're, we're very, very privileged and excited to be a part of that program. Yeah, and that, that's, I mean, we're talking urban air mobility and, and the growth of that and then the uh, autonomous flight with these unmanned aerial vehicles, et cetera, and all of the combined uh, for, for package delivery, uh, et cetera, and, and, and integrating that into airspace that the rest of us are flying in. Right. Yeah. And those vehicles run the gamut, you know, because Joby's vehicle, it, at least in its first iteration, is going to be piloted. Okay. It's going to be very highly augmented digital flight controls, but it's still going to have a pilot. Whereas, so for instance, the WISC vehicle and beta vehicle, they're autonomous out of the gate. They're saying, hey, here we come, and we're just going to turn this thing loose on, on the world. And it sounds funny to say, uh, but it's true that there is a lot of reticence to letting these things fly around because people have seen the Terminator movies and <laughs> things like that. And they're worried yeah. about these things going rogue and yeah, bringing nasty exactly. things. Well, and that's, and, uh, that, yeah. that's a, nothing else a perception problem. So Absolutely. But, but the other, the good side of this is that it offers a lot of new opportunities career-wise oh, for, for the next generation that's coming up in engineering and computer science uh, and all the other aspects of STEM. Uh, and, and they're going to need some brainiacs to help figure this out and, and put it all together because there will be a time when we will have this stuff in operation, which is why you guys are doing the testing and FAA, et cetera, is, is trying to write the, uh, the regs on it, the regulations. So, and, and, and particularly in, in the aerospace side, because, you know, if, if you look at, if you look at other industries, you know, you have mechanical engineers that cover cars and HVAC and, you know, all this other stuff, it's very generalized, but even in engineering, you have aerospace engineering specifically for things that leave the planet. And, now you, you're going to have these AI vehicles where you've got all these other things going on. You've got all these really highly complicated systems and computers and computer engineering, all that kind of stuff, but you still got to understand how the air works. You still got to understand orbital mechanics. You still got to understand all that stuff. And someone's going to have to bridge that gap. And right. I, my, my expectation is that's going to be a very specialized group of individuals that are able to speak all those languages at once and make it all work. Absolutely. Isai, while we have a few minutes, do you have any other questions for Scott? Um, I, I don't have any more. Okay. And, and Cody, how about you? Yeah, so, uh, so for this whole panel, we've talked a lot about AI, um, but, also, but Vince also mentioned that I specialize in uh, data science as well, which is kind of a subset of artificial intelligence where um, instead of creating some sort of solution to be able to solve a specific problem, data science kind of takes a look at data that, for example, uh, flight research might have collected. And uh, using the data science process, you could sort of uh, look into different relationships between uh, certain things that go on that the data has collected to discover new problems that um, that maybe you guys didn't know about. Um, and my question is, have you guys looked into any sort of um, data, sci data science, data analysis sort of problems within uh, your company? Um, yes, we have, uh, we have a customer uh, that is testing a data science type capability on a new airframe. Uh, and that airframe, see how much I can say about this. 
Um, so that system is a, is a proof of concept system. And so they're putting it on an experimental aircraft. Um, and we are the ones that are integrating that system onto the aircraft, getting it its airworthiness and, and getting it in the air for them. So uh, again, that's, that's where we kind of fit. We fit in this, in this crossroads of all these things going on. Um, and, and we bring that, that aviation expertise into these other industries. So that, that definitely exists. Because basically the way we're designing these vehicles is, is we're trying to make the vehicle, whatever's controlling the vehicle, act like a human. I mean, that, that's what we're doing because that's what we know. That's what we do across the board. Airplanes, we try to make fly like birds because we can't fly, but, you know, it's the same deal. So we, we make the cognitive process, the things that the computers are looking for, the same things that we would look for. And maybe that's wrong. Maybe we should be looking at other things because Lord knows we're not perfect, but that's what we're doing. Um, and again, that's going to be an interesting point. But yes, at Flight Research, we are involved in testing systems that use uh, use data science as a, as a, uh, as minimum as a tool, if not more than that. Very cool. Cool. Listen, uh, we're, we're going to run out of time in a few minutes. So I wanted to give each of you an opportunity, uh, to give us an idea of what you have in mind for your future after you finish your education. What, what are your goals? Uh, I'll start with you, Isai. So once I graduate, uh, from my high school with my diploma and two associate's degrees. I plan on uh, taking this route that my particular high school offers. Um, since we're partners with Cal Poly, they offer 10 full ride scholarships to the senior classes every year. And um, I already got a verbal confirmation from my principal once I took him up on his first glider ride ever that um, I would be very, very high on the priority list to receive that. So Because you brought him back down alive? Yeah, he came back down alive, yeah. <laughs> But um, great principal going up with, with with his student in a glider. Yeah, the funny thing was he didn't. Um, apparently, I forgot to tell him that my airplane was a glider, so it didn't have engine. So when he came to the airfield, he was really surprised that the airplane was so small and engineless. He thought he you were going to be getting in the tow plane, not with the motor, right? Not the not the glider. <laughs> yeah, he thought I would have power, but um, he said regardless that he would have flown with me anyway. He had lots of fun. That's good. So and what do you want to do after you, you finish your college education? Do you do you have an inkling of what direction you might want to go? Um, it. I'm really thinking, honestly, I'd not too sure how it's going to play out like you said earlier like i can plan so many things but it's going to go like a certain way um but i'm thinking that it's going to be really heavily based on my hours since i know my ultimate goal is to become an airline for a captain and so i need to build up those 1500 hours for the airline transfer pilot's license and i feel like um if i don't have enough hours by then i'll probably think about getting my cfi rating and teaching other people so then I can build up my hours to get to that point. Gotcha. Good. How about you, Joshua? What do you, what do you, I mean, you're in eighth grade, you got a long road ahead of you, but you've got, you've been able to meet some really uh, influential people in the industry, including uh, Brigadier General McGee. So what do you think you're going to want to do with the experiences you've had as of late, including uh, your time at Oshkosh? As of right now, uh, I'm interested in going into space, being an astronaut, but I don't know what I want to do. Uh, it can change. I'm just want to chase my interest, and today helped a lot. Good, good. Cody, how about you? You're you're the grown one of the three. <laughs> yeah. So uh, actually, currently, um, uh, besides just going into my senior year, I'm currently looking for um, a full time uh, full time employment for after I graduate specifically in the aviation industry. Um, I hope to work with, um, work with companies such as like Boeing or Airbus or um, Lockheed Martin, just any, any, uh, any big aviation company would be absolutely phenomenal. But, um, but aside from that, like the main reason I wanna do that is because I wanna get into somewhere where uh, not only I can just apply my skills, but I can grow um, in my skill set and as a person 
I want to be able to experience as much as I can, especially in the aviation industry, because it really interests me. And yeah, that's that's why I got so far. We'll see where life takes it, though. So awesome. I'll take it back to you, Scott, and let you, as I like to say, take us home. Uh, any final words of advice for these uh, young men uh, in their future? Yeah, um, you all uh, are very impressive, and I look forward to your accomplishments and seeing your accomplishments in, into the future. Um, I, I thank you, Vince, for uh, for the opportunity to talk to them today and for setting this up. I, this is a great opportunity that you all have working with uh, with Mr. Mickens, and um, just keep following your dreams, keep following your passions, work hard. And, uh, and you'll get to, you'll get to wherever it is uh, you want to be. And I know that sounds cliche, uh, but it, it's the truth, man. I'm, I'm here. I'm living proof. Just, uh, just keep sticking to it. Well, well said. Gentlemen, it's been great to have all of you on the show. Young men, I'm, I'm uh, quite proud of all three of you. I think you guys show um, great potential and promise in terms of what you want to do. Uh, and we'll all do well in your aspects and interests of the industry. But it was really cool to have you on here and to talk to someone like Scott. As Scott said, we probably could have done a two or three hour show to talk about all of the things that he he has done and, and that he's currently doing with flight research. I even learned a couple of things about flight research today that I, I wasn't aware of. So really cool. This sounds like a really cool company. And even if, if you call being in the low 90s mild, well, you know, so be it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. But you have clear skies a lot. So that, that's that's. Yeah. The severe clear is something we all as pilots like, right? Um, again, guys, thank you very much for being on All Things Aviation and Aerospace. I hope you um, all enjoyed uh, the opportunity. Thank you so much. You guys take care. My name is Vince Mickens with All Things Aviation and Aerospace, a weekly webcast where we talk about the opportunities in the industry with uh, seasoned industry professionals and, and some of the young people either about to get into the industry or have just started and are at the early stages of their career. So uh, to our viewers and listeners, thank you very much for joining us. Catch you guys next week. Have a good one.